Welcome to the Mysteries of Mental Illness live virtual screening and discussion event. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Exploring Mental Health virtual preview event of the new PBS series, Mysteries of Mental Illness. WCNY is pleased to host this event tonight with the support of our generous sponsor, Prevention Network. Throughout history to today, we've continued to grapple with the deceptively simple questions regarding mental health. What is mental illness? From where does it come? And how can it be treated? Mysteries of Mental Illness explores the story of mental illness in science and society, tracing the evolution of this complex topic from its earliest days to present times. The four-part series examines the dramatic attempts across generations to unravel the mysteries of mental illness and to give voice to contemporary Americans across a spectrum of experiences. We are very excited that tonight's event will feature a panel discussion around the film, Mysteries of Mental Illness, with local mental health experts. We will watch a screening version of the program, followed by a live question and answer session. We invite you to join the discussion using the chat function, the full program, Mysteries of Mental Illness will premiere June 22nd at 9 p.m. on WCNY TV. Thank you for joining us. And now, a special message from tonight's sponsor. Prevention Network has been assisting individuals and families to lead healthier lives since 1949 by providing programs and services which prevent addictions and address other problem behaviors. Prevention Network continues to positively impact Central New York communities and is a resource for prevention, wellness and recovery information, services, training and treatment referrals. If you or a loved one needs assistance or to learn more about our programs and services, call Prevention Network at 315-471-1359 or visit PreventionNetworkCNY.org. God, we bless your name on today. We bless your name on today, oh God. The hardest thing to do today, oh is to feel like you are walking through the valley God, of the shadow of death and there's no one with you. You've been constant, oh God. But most of all, oh God, you've been consistent in our lives. So God, we bless your name right now. In my 20s, I began to experience bouts of depression. I never sought help because that was not part of the common conversations that took place in my community growing up or in my house coming up. In my 30s was the first time I had any suicidal ideations. There were numerous days where I didn't want to preach, I didn't want to teach, I didn't want to talk to people, but I, didn't, I felt like I never had the option of not doing it because of the, the weight and responsibility of my call. And so like so many people who battle with depression and other conditions, you suffer in silence. Because I didn't want to be labeled, nothing is wrong with me, I'm a pastor. To say that, oh, I'm going to see a therapist is tantamount to saying, I don't trust God can do it. I don't believe that prayer can do it. And no one wants to say, I don't trust God and I don't believe in the power of prayer. But it became torturous that people saw me as representing some level of healing and yet I felt no resolution within myself for that. And it took a long time for me to actually reach out. I remember going to that first therapy appointment with all sorts of walls up, not wanting to admit that something was really wrong. Because as a black man, there's not a desire for one more label. Oftentimes there's a, 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 a dangerous reductionism that takes place. The individual becomes synonymous with the thing they're wrestling with. So that when you see me potentially, you don't see me, you see my thing. You see, oh, uh, he's depressed. Oh, he's black. Like these ways we reduce one another by disregarding the humanity of the other person, it, well, has a tragically long history in this country. In the 1970s, Michael Walrand was growing up and struggling with mysterious health issues. A doctor labeled him with a psychiatric disorder, hypochondria. I 
heard that word often growing up because no one could pinpoint what was wrong with me. I have a rare disease, um, common variable immunodeficiency, although I was misdiagnosed for 36 years. As I grew, something was always wrong. Hospitalized, emergency rooms. I remember some people thought I was trying to get out of school, but I wasn't feeling well. And then because no one necessarily had answers, but I knew what I was feeling, it put you in a space where there were days you don't really want to get out of bed. There are days you don't really, you don't really want to engage people. I was experiencing these, what I would now call depressive moments. And at the heart of it was my physical challenges. And to seek out help almost affirms that maybe I am crazy. The first Sunday of the year, we talked about courage. Then we talked about anger, then complacency. And then last Sunday, we talked about joy, joy. And today we're going to talk about, well, it's obvious, healing. When I first started talking about depression openly, you know, not too many pastors were going to go on the pulpit and talk about having suicidal ideations. No. Because the first thing, the reason why you don't speak about it is a thought that, well, there are countless, countless people who wrestle with this and may come to me looking for some resolution. How do I tell them I'm dealing with the same thing? So that stops so many of us from being transparent. There have been moments in my life where I've fought depression and darkness and that feeling of a shadow hovering over me and I felt like I had no one to turn to. But for me, as I was able to name issues around anxiety and depression, it helped other people see the, the characteristics, the traits, maybe this is what's happening with me. That made my transparency, my vulnerability necessary, not just for me, but for other people. As we often say in church, I'm not where I used to be, and I'm not fully where I'm going to be, but I thank God for progress. I was diagnosed with OCD when I was in sixth grade. My family, they support me all the way. But I hid my OCD from people for so long because I was scared of getting judged. I didn't accept it, and I was like, that's, that's not who I am. I don't want people to know that that's who I am. I came out with my OCD to the public in 2015 at the Olympic trials because I knew that I was going to be around like my team members 24-7 and rooming with them. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to hide it from them. It's not gonna work. <laughs> I forgot I was out of late um, plastic bags, but I got an idea. See, when, I, when I'm out of something and I need to do something, I can figure out a way to get around. This thing in the middle, the top of it is contaminated to me because it doesn't really get washed. So I always have to cover that because it'd be impossible to take that out without my clothes touching it. Obsessive compulsive disorder is classified as an anxiety disorder that causes repetitive unwanted thoughts and compulsive behaviors. What we look at to determine if something meets the threshold of OCD is the frequency and intensity and level of distress that it causes. So this happens with this um, washing machine. My arm touched the side, so now I gotta go wash it off. With Jenny, her symptoms right now are at a severe level and that the compulsions take up several hours a day. I'm so focused on getting that clean feeling of what it is at the moment, I'm not realizing the mess I'm creating around me. The tip of this has actually touched that, which is contaminated to me, so. I can't use like the squirt or anything. I just have to take this off. I could spend almost $500 a week on just supplies. And I go through soap a lot. 
When I moved to the Olympic Training Center, so these past four years, I've relapsed really bad. It has hit me very hard to the point to where I feel no control over it. This quarantine has not helped. It's kind of made it worse. I've My anxiety level is from a scale from one to 10. It's just, I wake up with an eight and I can't get it down to a one. Okay. It's the only thing in my life that is really like, it's like a, kind of a good way to describe it, like possesses me. It's kind of scary. <laughs> Okay. I hate these washing machines. <laughs> so I bring myself down a lot. Like I'm never gonna be able to have a normal life. I'm not gonna be able to own a house and I'm never gonna be able to have kids. And it's so distressful. So it takes so much energy. So that took a lot of energy just doing that. And I do that every day, three to four times a day. These items right here, I have to rewash them because it touched the, it, the rim of the washing machine that it, I feel contaminated. But my therapist he tries to get me out of that negative loop so I don't go down that hole. So we're kind of manipulating my mind in a way. didn't think mental illness was something that happened to normal people. When I thought of mental health issues, I thought of the stereotypical straight jacket, padded room type things. You know, somebody uh, like in a vegetative state on meds, just laying in a bed. Ryan Maines is a veteran and first responder. Like many, he's struggled to accept his diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder and the stigma that comes with it. There's a term in the ultra running community called brutiful, a combination of br brutal and beautiful. And I so much love that term. It's pain and it's glory and it's how long can you push yourself? My next run is going to be 130 kilometers that distance specifically because over 130 firefighter paramedics died by suicide last year. It's not something that's known, it's not something that's talked about. Ryan was a frontline medic for four years during the U.S. occupation of Iraq. When he returned home, he joined the fire department in Woodstock, Illinois. That's when it kind of hit me. I'd have intrusive thoughts about my time in Iraq. You, you just you see things that are hard to forget, and um, they kind of overlap with intrusive thoughts from things that happen at work. I would lose my temper and, and start yelling, and um, that happened a lot, and I didn't see it at the time. I started avoiding work, calling off sick for a few shifts. When a fire department counselor diagnosed PTSD, he rejected the label. I said, go fuck yourself. That's not for me. I had a tremendous amount of shame. Oh. What I didn't realize was I was just setting myself up for a bigger fall later. I had a lot of self-stigma about my diagnosis and my struggles. Irritability, poor sleep, rash decision-making. When I started to have those feelings, I just ignore it. But the thought of being on an ambulance was overwhelming. I was unable to find the motivation to do anything, to bathe, to take care of myself, you know, laying in bed with suicidal ideations. Like many war veterans and first responders, Ryan spent a few weeks at a psychiatric facility specializing in PTSD. At the time, 
I thought that I was cured, but it's pretty peaceful there. And then you come back to real life with your kids and, and work and bills. And it was a pretty rude awakening. All those dark, empty feelings started creeping back. The therapist at work told me that I was unfit for duty. I couldn't go back. Now, it wasn't just, I need to take some time to get myself right. It was, I can't do the job anymore. It reinforced some of that stigma. Ryan is one of many across generations to feel stigmatized by his inability to recover from trauma. World War II psychiatrists contributed to this misunderstanding. One of the ways psychiatry persuaded its military superiors during the war that it was doing such a great job was it produced statistics on how wonderfully it was doing. Those statistics were made up and bogus. You still doing your sunset? The authors of DSM-3 created the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder to finally recognize the enduring effects of trauma. But it's not easy to overcome the legacy of stigma. I've always been an advocate of, you know, end the stigma, everything, you know, it's okay to not be okay, etc. until it was happening to me. Are you done with that one? Like all mental disorders in the DSM, PTSD is defined by symptoms, not biology. In the hopes of someday changing that, scientists are searching for trauma's biological fingerprints. When I started my postdoctoral fellowship, I had never heard of post-traumatic stress disorder. Many people didn't believe that this diagnosis was real, and certainly very little was known about it. So I joined a lab that was the first group that began examining the biology of PTSD in hopes of understanding what it was. So we've had to create a whole language for this. We've had to create a whole science for this. The tools that we needed haven't even been available for that long. Over 30 years of research, Rachel Yehuda has helped unravel some of the biology of PTSD. We really understand from brain imaging studies right now that experience does produce physical changes in us. Yehuda's work shows that trauma can damage crucial connections between the memory and emotional processing centers of the brain. These connections are made of tissue called white matter. White matter refers to a part of the brain where the neurons can carry information from one neuron to the next. So in a sense, you can think about there being highways in between structures in the brain. And then the question is, how good is the highway? And what you see in somebody with PTSD is, you know what, it may not be running that great which really accounts for things like over-responding to triggers or feeling that things are dangerous in the environment when they're not actually dangerous in reality. But the strength or integrity of these neural highways often improves when patients confront problems using a distant descendant of Freud's psychoanalytic approach called cognitive behavioral therapy. There is an idea that the reason you can't talk about the trauma is because you're afraid that if you talk about the trauma, you'll become really distressed. But if you do this in a safe environment with a therapist, the therapist can tell you that your distress doesn't mean that this is happening all over again. And continuing to tell the story over and over again may reduce the distress. And this can make changes in your brain circuitry. In somebody who has successfully responded to therapy, we start to see that white matter integrity building up. We can see it improve. So we're not exactly where we need to be, but we've come a long way from where we started. Since his counselor at the fire department declared him unfit for duty, Ryan's turned to a type of cognitive behavioral therapy called exposure therapy. But what would be maybe as close to a hundred in intensity? One of the uh, one of the traumatic calls that we went on at work. For him, this involves the retelling of trauma narratives, 
in revisiting the scarring experiences that ended his career. So I want you to close your eyes, and when you're ready, you can start describing the narrative. I don't remember exactly what time it was. Um, it was dark. We had toned out for a hit and run uh, child that was struck by a vehicle. We were the first ones on the scene. I see the child laying on the ground. Um, family says that, uh, that the vehicle that hit him didn't stop. Uh, I jumped in the ambulance. As we pulled up to the ER, the ER staff was waiting for us outside. Oh, give me a level. 75. Um, that was about the time that the family started to arrive. I hear the screams. From the family, um, when the, the ER staff told them that they, they, were, um, they were stopping, that there was nothing, uh, nothing else that they could do. I felt really angry. I was, I was furious. I think I even threw some things. I was so angry. I'm just gonna take a moment right now. Before we go back into it, I really want you to do your best to speak through the memory as if it was happening right now, okay? okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewind right back to the beginning. One of the misconceptions I had about PTSD was that I would go to treatment and it would be cured and I never had to deal with it again. I hear the reaction from the family, I hear the screams. I have a better understanding now in that it's never gonna go away. It'll always be there. Give me a level. 85. And emotionally, how did that feel? Gut-wrenching. My reaction to it has changed, and I think that has been the most powerful uh, thing for me. Can you feel any physical sensation right now as you're recounting this? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I've got that uneasy feeling in my stomach. Okay. My PTSD doesn't own me as much if I can control my reaction to it. I don't know how it's gonna go over the next 10 years. I just try and handle each moment as it comes. You did a great job. It's commendable the amount of courage that you show in being willing to open this wound up again. We're gonna be revisiting this event as many times as we need to in order to clean out that wound so that it can heal effectively. Out, guys. Ryan's last day at the fire department was over a year ago. Ooh, this is my pension beard, so until I get to get that settled, we're just gonna let it go. <laughs> Today, he'll run one kilometer for every firefighter paramedic who's died by suicide in the past year. He's raising money so others living with PTSD can get treatment. It's going to be brutal. When I initially told people that 130 firefighter paramedics died by suicide last year, they were shocked. Here we go, guys. Love you. There's so many mental health issues that we haven't done a good job of as a society to this point talking about. So I'm hopeful that the more I speak out, the more okay others will be with it. And the more normal it becomes, all right, good job.
If I lived in a different time, I could have very easily have been labeled as a witch. It could have cost my life. When I was very young, maybe five, I remember seeing shadowy figures. I got very confused and scared about what it was. I thought that I was maybe possessed. I grew up in a very religious community, so I was embarrassed about these hallucinations because I started thinking that maybe this is a punishment, maybe I did something wrong. Cecilia McGow turned away from religion and towards science for answers to the unknown. I loved school. Uh, it was an, an escape for me, and I became quite the nerd. When she was 17, Cecilia fell in love with astrophysics and helped discover a type of collapsed star called a pulsar. That was an amazing opportunity, but it was the same time that my hallucinations were becoming much more prevalent. I started hearing staticky whispers and struggling with scattered thoughts. I, up to like the moment, I was like, so yeah, it, it just might come up in the screens like, you know, like nothing's there, you know, or, oh, there's a, a lot of RFI there, you know, it must have been some wacky radio signal, you know. These symptoms progressed. And then I watched the older adaptation of Stephen King's It. It really resonated with me because the kids were seeing something that the adults weren't. And I started seeing like these shadowy figures, very similar to the clown. I think like something with my consciousness sort of like latched on to that figure and it's still a hallucination that I struggle with 24-7, um, even to this day. I kept these hallucinations very much a secret. I was hoping that maybe if I moved away, things would change. But it was quite the opposite. In college, I tried to go to different mental health clubs, but no one was really talking about hallucinations. Uh, so it, in a way, even stigmatized it more because I felt like if I can't even open up about this in a mental health space, then like, it, it, is there something that wrong with me? It was just a very dark time in my life. I wasn't just losing my future, but I was also losing my mind. And I didn't know if I wanted to live like that. I thought it would be better to just sort of end things. And I tried to uh, take my own life. Schizophrenia, not unlike any other diagnosis, is defined as clusters of certain kinds of symptoms. And we know good and well that you could take two people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and they'd be completely different as far as how they present, the challenges they may face, their strengths, their vulnerabilities, so on and so forth. You know, there's a big push now to call it the schizophrenias because there's not really one uniform presentation. That's because we're still basing everything off of symptoms. Hey, it's Dr. Coombs. As researchers continue to unravel the mystery of mental illness, they investigate the complex interplay between biology and life experience. We know that there are multiple factors, but we don't know exactly, you know, which factors are playing out more in which person. How much of it is, you know, a biological component, how much of it is social, how much is psychological, how much is it relates to trauma and all different kinds of aspects is the question. So many genes are involved. For schizophrenia, 150. Interacting in permutations that are probably in the billions. That there's never any specific genetic pattern that explains a particular clinical presentation. We know more than we ever have, but there's still a lot that's not known. And so that's a big reason why the stigma persists. 
I didn't talk about my hallucinations at all after my first suicide attempt. I didn't feel comfortable. It took me eight months after that to finally get treatment. I've had three near attempts uh, since then. So I am someone who still struggles with thoughts of suicide. Even after her diagnosis, Cecilia tried to hide her symptoms, but failed. My second psych ward stay, I had to open up afterwards because the police were involved. They patted me down in front of my roommates and I, I had to convince them not to put handcuffs on me. I wasn't at all refusing to go. I, I have no history of violence. I believe I was gone for 10 days. And when I came back, people knew something was up and I had to set the story straight. So I opened up through a social media post. And that's when I started realizing that, you know, this is something that needs to be talked about more. So I'm Cecilia Miguel. I'm the blogger for the I Am Not A Monster Schizophrenia Project. I have a real problem of getting trapped, trapped in my bedroom because my hallucinations are the worst when I wake up. I'm doing this live stream right now because it's important that I do these live streams even when I'm, when I'm struggling. There's extensive data which shows that um, if you're treated for an acute episode of schizophrenia, particularly er earlier at the beginning of your course of illness, um, your response to treatment is very good. But if left untreated, brain imaging suggests schizophrenia gets worse over time. Cecilia didn't start therapy or medication until 15 years after her first hallucinations. This is my first video since coming back from my sixth uh, psych ward stay. And like many living with schizophrenia, she's tried a variety of drugs and therapeutic approaches. Sometimes I feel like it's a choice for me to take my medicine, go to sleep, be a good patient, or stay up and do work because my medicine makes me go to sleep. 80% plus people will have a very significant response to antipsychotic drug treatment. Um, the thing is, is sustaining that. I tried different medications. Oh, some of them would make the hallucinations worse. When I see those giant spiders, that usually happens during the medicine changes. With schizophrenia, we believe that there's a certain biological component, but it's not the full story. So what that means is that when we look at treatment, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that using the same antipsychotic with a different person who will work in the same way. Welcome to the live Q&A portion of tonight's event. Please add your mental health related questions for us in the Zoom chat and we will answer as many questions as possible. My name is Dr. Rich O'Neill. I am a psychologist at Upstate Medical University. Joining me tonight are... Ashley Daly, I'm the Family Support Navigator with Prevention Network. Dr. Chris Lucas, I'm a child psychiatrist from Upstate. Jennifer Parmalee, I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Children and Family Services for Onondaga County. Dr. Robert Gregory, I'm a psychiatrist at Upstate and director of the Psychiatry High Risk Program. Ashley, why don't you start us off with picking a question and answering it? All right, so what is the best way to improve your mental well-being? Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You could uh, take up a new hobby, ask, seek support from friends and family. Uh, anything in nature or exercise are going to be really beneficial to your, your mental health and well-being. And of course, if it's significantly impairing your ability to function day to day, seeking medical treatment. So I actually rode my bike over here tonight. So th I'm big on the exercise thing. It really helps up with the Absolutely. endorphins. Yeah, it's great for us. Chris, take off the next one. Okay. So um, what do you think are the most important psychological disorders associated with COVID-19? Okay. Well, that's quite a big question because COVID-19 really affected us more than we could have ever expected. There's been both the bereavement and illness 
There's been the disruption in education, the disruption in social supports. And then what we've seen as a result of that is that the um, been a massive increase in the amount of anxiety and depression experienced, um, particularly an increase in suicidal thinking and suicide attempts, particularly in teenage girls, and also an increase in disorders that are usually reasonably rare, such as eating disorders. So overall, COVID has been a massive impact. So we've had a pandemic due to a virus, and I think we're due to have a pandemic of mental, mental illness as a result of this. Thank you, Chris. And Jennifer. Yes, so how can I cope with the stress and anxiety I'm experiencing because of the pandemic? I think it's just so important to recognize and to be able to articulate that you are struggling. I think that is an incredibly powerful and important first step. Um, a second really important step is to really be thinking about who you can talk to for support. There are so many supports in all of our lives. And because of the stigma, oftentimes we feel like we shouldn't be talking about it. Um, so really talk with your friends, your family, people that you trust uh, to talk about the stress and anxiety that you're experiencing and try to get an understanding as to whether or not really seeking professional help would be a good idea. There's phenomenal supports within our community uh, and stress and anxiety are absolutely uh, treatable, supportable uh, challenges that people are facing. You know, one of the things that I discovered, uh, Jennifer, when I was dealing with my mother having Alzheimer's disease, it was, it was the most stressful thing in my whole life, uh, was as soon as I started to talk about it, there were so many people who would say, I'm in the same boat. We actually started calling it being in the club. I'm in the club of having somebody trying to take care of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. So it was a great relief to have people just to talk to. Dr. Gregory. So question is, how do you recommend I speak to and help someone with a mental health problem like depression or anxiety? And um, I think it's a great question because often families or friends are the first persons that people might reach out to and talk to. So, you know, how do you approach it? And I think the most important thing is not to jump in right away and try to fix things and come up with suggestions, but just try to listen and figure out what's going on with this person? You know, what are the stresses? When did it start? What are the symptoms? In particular, is it serious enough that they're having thoughts of suicide or death? Um, because, uh, you know, if you don't ask, if you don't ask about suicide, they're unlikely to tell you. And they may just be all alone with those thoughts. So, you know, the the take home message is don't be afraid to ask. You're not going to tip someone over into suicide, but go ahead and ask. And, um, you know, if, if they are struggling, you need to figure out, is this someone who needs immediate help or um, like an emergency room or uh, calling a hotline or is it, or is it someone who can see a mental health counselor or psychiatrist? Um, but just ask the question. Yeah, great advice, uh, Robert. I, I know when I've talked to people uh, who I think might be suicidal and I just ask the question, they're often greatly relieved just to have somebody to talk to. Oh, no one's ever asked me. And it's a great relief just to have somebody open up the topic uh, yeah. and not be afraid to say, hey, let's do something about this. Yeah. Uh, my question, uh, I am the female version of Ryan in the show we just saw. My service dog and mindfulness practices are the only things that help. Where does the professional psychiatric world stand with those two things and their benefits and weaknesses? You know, one of the things we've found in the research over the past number of years has been how positive having a pet is for people's mental health. Uh, many of the people that I've worked with are often just they just we just love our pets my own dog passed away a few years ago and we miss still miss her but we love our pets and that love is really positive it's one of the most positive things that we experience for our mental health and mindfulness again a tremendous amount of research showing mindfulness is very useful for our just general well-being um so next question back to you ashley um 
what can the general public do to advance the knowledge of children's mental health? I think the biggest thing, um, in my personal opinion, is to normalize those conversations around mental health so that children know that they can come to you when they're feeling anxious, sad, depressed. They don't know that terminology. They're too young to understand it. So if we have those conversations as part of our, our day-to-day interactions with youth, then they know that they can come to people and not feel shamed into silence, feeling like they're different than other people. So I think that would be my big biggest takeaway. And maybe add in like, oh, gee, that's a feeling that I've had myself. So yeah. they don't feel like they're not alone with yeah, it. Normalizing yeah, normalizing it for sure. Yeah. Um, Dr. Lucas. Okay, well, maybe building on that. Uh, my question is, what are today's pressing issues in children's mental health? So I think one of the things to appreciate is that at least half of all mental illness that's going to be experienced in your lifetime begins before the age of 14. Um, mental health has an incredible stigma towards it. Um, it's important, I think, to try and see uh, addressing mental health as important as addressing physical health, as a, important as addressing educational achievement, because mental health in children affects both of those things. They are physically more unhealthy and their education suffers. So I think really having it as part of what we do in primary care, in pediatrics, what we do as part of schooling is probably the most important thing we need to address. So really make it a sort of part of our everyday conversation so Absolutely. we don't have to be afraid to talk about it. Terrific. Jennifer, back to you. Thank you. Um, let's see here. What can we do as concerned citizens to push more for more mental health training for our police departments? Uh, there have been really great opportunities in New York State, especially around police reform that have been happening. Um, and many citizen opportunities to get out and talk to your leadership around that piece. Be as vocal as absolutely possible. Um, really just kind of get out there and, and make calls to your local officials and uh, to your local police departments. One of the things I've discovered, too, is that the, the police are actually pretty highly trained in dealing with mental health issues. So I have felt free to call them when I, for instance, when I had a patient of mine who was suicidal, I felt, oh, this is somebody is a partner for us in dealing with this problem. And and it was, turned out really well. So, yes, I think yeah. the police can be excellent partners, absolutely. Yeah. I think the reality of um, managing an individual who may be in crisis, I think it's very difficult for police officers to ever be trained to the level at which for them to feel really, really comfortable. So we're working uh, in dealing with that population. And so we're working as a community in Onondaga County to really be thinking about what we can be doing. Uh, we're working with the police, with the sheriff's office, um, to be thinking about what we can be doing to support uh, a co-response, for instance. So we have mobile crisis teams respond with police agencies. So, so mental that, health professionals yes, along sorry, with thank the police. You. Oh, wonderful. Yes, That's mental fabulous. health professionals with potentially individuals who are peers who may have experienced mental health challenges responding with police so that together the expertise that the police have around tactical responses and whatnot with a trained mental health professional uh, can be a really, really positive experience. And people may, may be less anxious with a mental health person than with a police officer. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that's great. Dr. Gregory. So um, what advice can you offer to people struggling with severe depression? So what I see most commonly and what I have seen is that even recognizing, even for someone to recognize that they're severely depressed can be a challenge. They may um, see themselves instead maybe having a vitamin deficiency or just needing to um, pull, them up, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and yet they keep having these negative thoughts and sense of hopelessness um, and uh, low energy, and they're, they're maybe losing weight because of appetite, and they can't focus or concentrate. And, um, and so recognizing the symptoms of depression, which I just went through, uh, I went through most of them, and recognizing that it, it, it's something that's very treatable and that there are actually a lot of really good treatments for it. Uh, there are many different kinds of psychotherapy that can be helpful. 
There are many, many different kinds of medication that people can get from their primary care physician or psychiatrists. And there are now a lot of procedures like uh, transmagnetic stimulation, uh, which can be very effective and is now pretty widely available. Uh, the psychiatry high risk program treats a lot of people with severe depression who are also struggling with suicide ideation. So there are resources in the community uh, for severe depression. But the main thing is, you know, don't just wait and think that you, you know, can do it all on your own, but really get the treatment that you need. And then you can add in lifestyle changes too, which are very helpful, such as exercise or yoga, meditation, you know, trying to get on a regular schedule, building better quality relationships. But the treatment's available, it's out there, and, um, you know, just try to, try to access it. Great. So one of the first, sounds like one of the first hurdles is get rid of the, the hopelessness and realize there are things that really help that you can, you can do. Absolutely. That are, yeah. Um, question for me. Um, how do I figure out who is emotionally mature enough to confide in, let alone be friends with? Well, uh, you know, I think you try that out, actually. What you do, uh, what I do, and what other people can do, is share something with somebody that's a little bit emotionally sensitive for you and see how they respond and then use how you feel about their response as the, the data to tell you, oh, this is a person who I feel comfortable with. They can tune into me and my emotional experience, and they can then respond in a way that feels good. And if, it, if you do that a number of times, you'll probably just become friends because when you're do, having that exchange, that is what builds friendships. Uh, one more round of questions. Ashley, over to you. All right. Um, so what are some of the common myths about OCD? Um, Obsessive so compulsive disorder. Yes. Yep. So I'm not, you know, 100% familiar with necessarily myths that are associated with it, but I feel that with any mental health issue, there are there's stigma around it. So we have this ideology that any mental health disorder is unmanageable. We have an image of who that person looks like in our mind, so particularly as it relates to OCD, somebody washing their hands obsessively, turning on and off the lights. Um, but that's not always the case. So mental health can happen in many forms, and they're not always what we see in movies and on TV, right? These are people that are in our community. So I think the biggest myth around OCD and all mental illnesses is that they're debilitating, that people don't recover and or aren't able to manage them when in reality they are. Great. Dr. Lucas. Okay. Um, are there specific tests available to evaluate my child, age nine, for ADHD? Well, ADHD is an incredibly common disorder, uh, particularly in childhood, um, but there is no one specific test so you can't go get a blood test, you can't really get a brain scan that's going to tell you whether your child has ADHD. So what you rely upon is a comprehensive clinical evaluation and together with informants um, giving information about that child, typically seeing the child in a group situation. So teachers are very good um, resources. Um, we tend to use a lot of self-report scales so that teachers and parents and uh, adolescents themselves could report on the symptoms of ADHD and these are available free of charge to download off the internet. There's plenty of resources in the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists, <laughs> their website, uh, where you could download some of these. So your, the judgment of the people around the child tends to be pretty reliable and valid in terms of telling whether that child yeah, has in, attention in a one-to-one -one interview with the child, it's very hard sometimes to see. But if you observe that child in a group setting, particularly if they're doing something that's not that interesting, you may be able to notice those uh, symptoms of ADHD. Oh, yeah, um, teachers have um, you know other children to compare to, and they are often giving children things to do that they don't quite like to do. Yeah. I can remember that experience. <laughs> Jennifer, over to you. Okay, what services are available for my child who is experiencing feelings of isolation, anxiety, and social disconnect while participating in distance learning during the pandemic? This is the question of the hour, is it not? Um, so many of our 
our kids and our families are struggling significantly during this pandemic, one of the things I would suggest first doing is talking to your school, your teachers, your social workers, psychologists, principals. There are adults at the school who care deeply about your children and want to see your child succeed. Um, so I would say the first place to go is really talk openly to your school about that piece. They may be able to help you figure out if there are other kids who might be feeling this way or if there are other kids. Maybe there are you know, families who are also reaching out that want their kids to, to um, socialize, but in a, in a way that you feel comfortable with for your family during this pandemic. That's really a hard piece for us to figure out right now, right? Like if, you, if you're still at a point where you wanted to be wearing masks and social distancing, um, or if you're feeling like, hey, let's go outside and let's you know, go to a park or something along those lines, making those connections between your child and other children I think is gonna be really important and your school can help you figure that out. If your school is not the place that you wanna to go to have that conversation, think about opening up to friends and families uh, to your friends and family, uh, then talk about like, hey, can we, can you brainstorm with me and help me think about a way that I can help bring my child out back into um, this community? It's, it's a very difficult piece that all of us are having to navigate through. And it's going to take a minute to think about what is the best way to introduce our children back into our community uh, after such a challenging moment. So all, all parents are probably working on that and you probably, everybody could put their heads together. You can Absolutely. share your expert, developing expertise yes. as we ch tackle this problem. Yes. It's all new to all of us. Yeah. Robert, over to you. So how do you support someone you know is struggling but is too scared to ask for help? So this is probably the most common question I get from families in the community. Um, they may have a loved one living at home, like a son or daughter who's struggling with some mental illness or even a spouse. And um, uh, first of all, I would say, you know, the, for the family member, if that's a situation, you know, try to get some support for yourself. Um, you know, meet other parents who are struggling with the same issue, uh, such as at, at the National Alliance uh, of the Mentally Ill. Uh, and there's a Syracuse chapter. It's a great group of families uh, who are part of that. If it's an addiction issue, um, uh, going to Al-Anon uh, is a is a um, is a 12-step approach, and you have families of people struggling with addiction who can really provide some great support and advice. And then to understand kind of why the person is a, is reluctant. And usually it has to do with a great sense of shame and stigma. And, um, you know, who wants to think that they're going crazy or that they have, you know, some mental problem or mental, you know, and, and so really helping to support their self-esteem and gently encouraging them um, to go into treatment uh, is, is, is the best strategy. And as I said, get support for yourself too. So maybe uh, when you're having that conversation, uh, saying, I'll be go willing to go along with you to this Great treatment idea. program or yeah. to this uh, provider so the person doesn't feel like they have to go it alone. Yeah, you know? great idea. Yeah. Well, we've concluded our Q&A portion of this evening's event. We hope you've enjoyed the event. Please be sure to join us for the premiere of Mysteries of Mental Illness on Tuesday, June 22nd at 9 p.m. on WCNY TV. We hope you have a great night and thanks to all of our panelists. Thank you for joining us for the Mysteries of Mental Illness live virtual screening and discussion event.